Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philip Preston and welcome to today's webinar Express, responding to lockdown shifts in digital behaviour hosted by CIM Wales. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 30 minutes, followed by a short five to 10 minute Q&A session. Uh, you'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the ask a question chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. Just to click the icon to open up the Q&A panel. Uh, you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. And if you want to share your thoughts on social media, uh, we are using the hashtag CIM events. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will share a link to the recording with you over the next few days. You'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the event, which we'd love you to complete. It will only take a few minutes. All survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. OK, I'd now like to hand over to Gareth Morgan from Liberty Marketing, who is our guest speaker today. Thank you, Philip. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, there's going to be three parts to this webinar. The first part, I'm going to show you some of the things we've observed from across our client list and look at some of the challenges we've had to adapt to in order to make sure they were OK. And I'm also going to look at data that we've seen from many external sources that grabbed our attention and made us react. Then in part two, uh, we're going to look at what you can do about all of this, how to gather data and then what to do about it. Um, and then part three is some of the longer term trends to be aware of and uh, things to plan uh, going forward post lockdown. Now, a uh, bit of a caveat, this is obviously an enormous subject and it's changing by the day. So I can't cover absolutely everything here, but I have tried to um, put in examples that, that are suitable for everyone. Um, my goal for this talk really is to show you some of the main things to have on your radar, how to go about prioritising your efforts and some considerations for future changes we're expecting. Um, at the end of this, there's going to be a link to some research and some tools so you can go away and sort of put this into action yourselves. Now, before I get into that, I'll just give you a very quick intro to Liberty, but don't worry, this is not a sales pitch. Um, this slide basically tells you what we do and who we do it for, um, but it's also why I can talk with some confidence about my findings. Um, so as an agency, we work with about 50 retained clients. We also have access to the data uh, for dozens more who we consult with. What this means is we've got visibility on millions of pounds a year worth of digital marketing spend. We get to see the behavior real changes of millions of visitors um, and this is across a wide range of markets and wide range of target customers so quite a few clients are b2b a number of them are b2c uh, a large chunk are in e-commerce whereas others are in lead gen uh, we work with a few startups and also a few FTSE 100s. So what this means is we're fortunate enough to have an absolute ton of data at our disposal which i can now share with you over the next few minutes so part one, like I said, it's all about the changes we've seen since the start of the UK lockdown back in March. And here's data from Uber Suggest that came out right back at the very start of things. And it shows where traffic has grown or declined over the main sectors. And it's very scary to see some of these changes. And you can see why marketers in things like the travel sector were right to panic. I promised myself I wouldn't use certain words in this webinar like unprecedented or new normal or any other of the entrants in coronavirus bingo, but unprecedented really is the best word for a situation like this. Where else have you seen a hugely popular growing market like travel lose over 40% of its activity overnight? So as marketers, we've had to adapt to the biggest changes of our careers in the shortest timescales. And what we saw, was that priority areas for people such as finance, food, news, medicine, they all grew, some of them grew very nicely, but everything else that wasn't vital to us or wasn't possible anymore thanks to COVID soon fell. And after the initial frenzy, people started adapting quickly. This data is from SEO Monitor and it shows uh, changes in search trends for some of the main categories. And we can see that wine searches, for example, went up 87 times on a year on year comparison. But then other areas suffered, such as evening dresses, which had just as big a fall. 
we saw the interest centered around a smaller group of things that can keep us going and anything that wasn't immediate to our needs went on the back burner. And what this meant is that overnight, many previously successful businesses were now desperately trying to find a market, whilst others saw overnight success without even having to try. And businesses on both sides of that now need to start thinking about what this means for them in the medium and the long term when things do start getting back to normal and how can they prepare for the next crisis. Here's a graph that shows uh, peaks and declines for three keyword sets that are representative of survival, sanity and normality searches. That uh, vertical red line is when lockdown kicked in. Uh, we decided to take a look at a whole range of keywords to do with survival, so things like hand sanitizer, tinned food, toilet roll, vitamins, etc. And what we saw was that the panic made all of these jump up really quickly, but they also soon started falling just as quickly. But then the next big jump was sanity type searches. So this is a kind of keywords to do with exercise equipment, food and beer, board games, etc. The things that we look for to keep us going uh, after we started to adjust. The interesting thing if you're in this market is they've remained a lot higher than they were before. And then in mid-May we saw normality coming back with searches like first time buy a mortgage as people are now starting to look much further forward and be less in the moment. But it wasn't just search habits that changed. Uh, this is analysis of 5.9 million sessions across a number of our e-commerce clients uh, that we work with. And what we can see here is uh, changes in browsing uh, behavior over time of day. Some of these are small percentage changes, but they still need to be considered because they often result in tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of visitors. And we saw that browsing dropped during traditional commuting hours. In April, people were doing their browsing during the day. And when you've got lots of people on furlough and lots of people working from home, you can see that they're combining their time on their laptops for both work and pleasure. But in May, when you compare it to April, almost an inverse pattern happened as people returned to a more normal browsing behavior. Uh, people were getting used to working from home, starting to contemplate how this will look going forward with some kind of a home-based and office-based hybrid job, while some others are returning to work perhaps. And it shows how within the space of a couple of months, the time when your brand needs to be present can completely U-turn. And that as marketers, we need to plan for enormous shifts like these. Uh, here's uh, data from Google Ads, and it shows how advert impressions also changed uh, and how they shifted to desktop within that first week of lockdown. Uh, this data actually comes from one of our larger B2B e-commerce spenders. Um, this was an early observation uh, when we went into lockdown that thankfully our PPC team spotted. So we were able to quickly build this into our approach and change the way we spent budgets. But you can see here that mobile was down quite significantly and computer usage was up. When you think back on it, it was obvious that this kind of thing was going to happen. If we're all locked down, a lot less people are out and about using their smartphones. But the shift of over a quarter of people going from one device to another is absolutely huge. And here's advert impression data across the entire range of our clients on the same subject to do with devices. Since that huge shift in March, things are again started to come back to normal. And the second half of May, we were back up to 69% of adverts being seen on mobile devices. The crazy thing about this shift in device usage is it was all the way back in 2016. It was the first time that mobile browsing overtook desktop. And in just one month, our browsing behavior went back by four years. If you think about how huge a change that is, it's not something that any of us were expecting. Uh, and channel usage changed as well. So here's data from a selection of our e-commerce clients in uh, a range of sectors on how social traffic uh, increased to their websites and decreased in a couple of examples. Uh, this data is subject to some caveats. I have to point out there's a, uh, probably a bit of a causation versus correlation argument to be made for a couple of them. Uh, it may be as a result of increased activity from the brands, but most of the people we've dealt with haven't done that much more social activity. In fact, a couple of the more prolific ones had their uh, marketing teams furloughed, so activity uh, fell, and also a lot of the paid social was either reduced or paused for a couple of months. Yet overall, on average, it's been up 85% across all of these brands. 
this is one of the uh, biggest areas of traffic growth we've seen, and it's definitely not something that we were expecting to be this different. And here's some external data to back that up. Everyone is saying they're spending more time on social. It's having a bit of a boom at the moment, and this is a huge behavioural change to consider. Should you spend more of your budget on social now and going forward? And then also think about the previous slides to do with device changes and time changes. How does this affect the content you're putting out on social? How does this affect the time you're posting messages? This channel is now more important to businesses than it was and user behavior has shifted and continues to alter. So we need to build this into our plans. And for the B2B marketers who joined us today, here's some data on the next couple of slides for you. Uh, the, according to a survey by McKinsey, preference for digital is now significantly higher than the more traditional sales interactions. Since the middle of the lockdown, B2B buyers are more than twice as likely to buy products and services digitally. And this has shifted from a, a majority preferring traditional methods just three to four months ago. And on top of that, self-serve digital ordering methods are now preferred. And unfortunately, most of the B2B companies I know are way behind their B2C counterparts when it comes to things like this. So the few that have sorted out a digital journey for their customers are the ones benefiting from the COVID lockdown. And if you can adapt quickly here, it could be very good for you. It's also worth noting on here big increases from search, which is up a third, social and also live chat as places buyers go to research and consider their future business suppliers. So all of these changes that we've seen are enormous. The types of searches we are, we are making and have been making over the last few months are different and they look like they're gonna be different going forward. We started off in survival mode. We quickly started uh, making sure our, our sanity was in check and now we're starting to turn into normal again. The time of day we are searching and browsing and the devices we're using has been changing over the past few months, as have the channels where we're spending most of our time and visiting websites. And uh, I think the scariest thing for most marketers is the speed of these changes. And that's what startled me the most. And if you take the mobile one, for example, the usage of mobiles fell more in a matter of days than it had grown in half a decade. We've never seen or faced volatility or challenges like this before but we need to get used to it. Whilst we're returning to normal, there's unfortunately more volatility to come. I'm certainly not here to scaremonger, but as marketers, we need to get used to big changes happening quickly. We need to consider this as part of our role. And it might be depressing, but it's the reality we now face. It's our jobs to be at the forefront of this and guide the brands we work for. The lessons we've learned during this period and the methods that we are refining as the days tick by are going to be just as valuable when the lockdown ends. So how can we manage this? Um, I mean, it's fair to say there is just way too much information at the moment. We're all getting absolutely bombarded with reports, blogs and insights into markets. So here's a simple approach that you may find useful. When it comes to being informed, find the data that really matters and make sure it's as up to date as possible. So your decision making is top notch. Be agile, put yourself in the place where you can take advantage of these huge quick changes and prepare things beforehand. And be prepared, don't throw away long-term strategies and plans, instead just adapt them. When it comes to staying informed, there's three areas to maybe concentrate your efforts during times like these. Three sources of data to seek out across your marketplace, your website and your competitors. And I'm going to give you three quick examples now of ones that might be relevant to your organisation. One good source for marketplace insights are the trends tools. So you've got Google Trends is one way to do this and it's definitely the most popular. But then there's also SEO Monitor does this uh, as well. And then there's plenty more. At times like these, historical searches go out of the window. We need to stay up to date as much as possible on the demand that's happening in our marketplaces. And one thing I'd recommend is to track keywords across the funnel, not just product keywords. If you can see searches that inspire product purchases are increasing or decreasing, then we can expect the same trend for the products themselves. 
During lockdown, we saw a huge surge in dry skin searches, and this led to a very closely following surge in moisturiser searches. If you have a good understanding of your buyer behaviour and you look further than just the keywords you're bidding on or optimising your websites for, then you can take advantage of this. Monitor the problems that people have and not just the solutions that you offer. And whilst orders will give you an indicator into what consumers are wanting more or less of, site search is also a great place to find insights into the changing needs of the consumer. When people come to your website, it now will be uh, for different reasons than what you're used to or expecting. And here's an interesting example for a furniture client. During work from home, we saw a rise in desk searches, which is obvious and quite predictable. But if you look at pillows, it's up 754% since the start of lockdown. We just didn't see that one coming. Um, and because we've noticed it, we're able to act on it. If you track and monitor your site search to see what people are looking for, then you can craft your content and your priority products and services around this new demand. And with competitors, we found that PPC auction data has been incredibly useful for giving us insights during the current situation. You can actually see within uh, Google Ads who's investing more or less in their paid media for the keywords you care about. So you can get a good idea of their priorities and their strategy. You can also see which rivals have chosen to pause their PPC during lockdown. So now may actually be the best time to start building up market share. An example here is for data for one of our larger spenders in the e-commerce space. It shows two competitors dropping in the auction, but one pushing more. What this meant is we could uh, we could significantly increase the impression shares uh, without having to spend much more money. But those last three slides are just three very quick examples of things you could take a look at, and there are loads more. Like I said, there's an absolute ton of data to dig through right now. So make it easy for yourself, automate it and build a dashboard. And I'd recommend using Google Data Studio if you aren't already. You can use it to import relevant metrics from things like your analytics, your search console, your Google ads, Facebook, your SEO software and more. You can see all of these hugely volatile areas in one quick place. Um, and there's also other tools to look into like analytics alerts and analytics insights to gain valuable up to date knowledge on performance and trends. Uh, and then moving on to some suggestions for being agile now. This uh, is the uh, example from earlier, highlighting the shift into desktop from mobile back in mid to late March. Fortunately for us, we didn't find this as much of a problem because we use bid automation a fair bit. The bidding strategy for this client changed automatically to match the change in user behavior. Now, whilst automation still needs to be managed and overseen, and in many cases it isn't perfect, it's the quickest way to adapt to changing user behavior like this. Now really isn't a good time to be relying on manual scheduling. Peak times have changed. What made sense for years as a good time to schedule your social messages or your adverts now probably isn't. If you can ask the machines to monitor this by the second so that you don't have to, then it can allow you to think about the bigger picture stuff. Uh, something we've invested in at Liberty is uh, consumer insights data so that we can see how people feel about brands and how they're engaging with advertising. One of these platforms is called Global Web Index and it gives us loads of lovely data like this to use for clients and for campaigns. And what this one showed us is that 30% of the general population said no to advertising at the start of the lockdown. They just weren't really up for it. However, by late April, that had already halved. The majority of people in the UK are now completely fine for you to advertise as normal. Whereas a lot of brands turned off their advertising or they reduced it and are yet to put it back. So if you've got access to data like this, you're able to react before your competitors. Uh, and I also thought I'd show this because here's people's thoughts on where brands should help them uh, deal with this situation. Originally, people wanted this, but now it's dropping. And is this because we're sick of brands trying to guide us through coronavirus? Or is it that we've adopted uh, sorry, adapted, and we no longer feel that brands can help. These are signals that people are moving back to normal and they're okay for us to sell to them again. 
And uh, this is quite an interesting, important uh, example that I saw, because what your site displays is very important for the user experience, especially now that people have disrupted needs and expectations. People are very concerned about product availability and how quickly they can get stuff, which is something I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, I noticed online that one furniture retailer put up a page for immediate delivery items. They changed their site to reflect that people wanted their goods right now in a way when it came to offering decent deals that was actually secondary. So is this something you can adapt uh, and learn from? Could you set up a process to update your pages and change things like page titles and meta descriptions um, when the situation itself changes? Can you take advantage of what people care about in these moments and quickly improve not only your click through rate, but also your conversion rate? How about um, home page call to actions? Could you have some ready to go or even a banner uh, for different scenarios? How can you prepare the assets and pages for different situations to go live when things next change? And also ensure that up to date stock information is in place and accurate in your shopping feed and the back end of your website. This is unfortunately a huge uh, problem and it's very common right now. And this is an example of one big retailer showing PPC ads for an item that's out of stock. I used uh, in the earlier examples, the increase in exercise bike searches to illustrate changes in demand. Uh, these products are actually up from 60,000 searches last year to 673,000 searches this year. That's an 11 fold increase. And even if you've got a really low cost per click, you can still waste a significant amount of money. Um, uh, and when you, the search volumes are this high by sending visitors to products they can't buy. So just make sure you're only ever advertising for stuff that you can actually sell and then deliver. Uh, and then in the final bit to do with being prepared, uh, this is quite a famous screenshot in the marketing world, but it proves that you need to make sure you are remembering your long term goals and fighting for your marketing budget right now. This uh, shows that following a budget cut, a brand will continue to benefit from the marketing investment made over the previous few years. It will mitigate any short term effects from the crisis and will result in a misleading increase in short term profitability. However, the long term harm can be considerable. If your brand goes dark, i.e. you pause your advertising or you stop your communications, it can have a hugely negative impact. This whole be prepared theme is a webinar in itself, but I'd say to gather as much data like this as you can, so that when you need to prove the value of marketing during times like these, that you're able to. And here's similar for B2B. This is from McGraw-Hill Research, where they analyzed 600 companies in 16 different sectors. The results showed that B2B companies that increased or maintained advertising spend during a past recession saw higher sales growth throughout the crisis and beyond. The startling thing is that by the end of the research here, which was actually way back in 1985, companies that kept up their advertising saw a sales increase of 256% over rivals that cut their advertising. I think an interesting uh, thing to note now and to think about is uh, this is the first crisis since digital marketing became mainstream. The data we have now, we didn't have back in the last recession and McGraw-Hill certainly didn't have back in the 80s. So as marketers, we should be able to prove more value this time around. Our ability to react to changes is a lot quicker and we can report on things a lot quicker. So we should be able to protect our budgets. And on to the final act now, the lessons we've learned during this period are going to be just as valuable when this lockdown ends. Here's a quote from Unilever that backs up uh, all of the data I've seen. Coronavirus and the subsequent lockdown has made us all much more digitally savvy and we're more likely to purchase online. Online retail sales growth was up an astonishing 33% year on year in May. That's the highest annual result since March 2008. The results represent a 14% month on month growth, building on the already steep increase in April. Um, whilst we should expect to see this settling down a bit now that stores are opening, and in fact, uh, just this week, there's been multiple uh, bits of research and multiple uh, reports coming out showing that this is starting to fall back. So we haven't changed our long term habits completely just yet. 
we are changing them and e-commerce will be bigger post lockdown than it used to be. And post COVID in all markets, people are expecting that they will buy more online, spend more time researching online and line up their in-store collections. You've probably heard of the phrase clicks and mortar before. Well, it's about to go through its next growth phase. The trend seems that people will research upfront and purchase online a lot more. Then they're going to make going to the shop more of an occasion. So they're going to tie it in with visiting friends for a coffee or a cocktail or a meal, perhaps pick up the goods whilst they're near the shop. Um, so physical stores are expected to be less of the destination, but a part of a bigger event that people value more. And here's data from a survey into the factors that people care about with regard to the future of online shopping. Uh, many of these factors are equally important across all age groups of reliable website, for example, which is fairly uh, obvious. But it's interesting that same or next day delivery are noticeably more important to 16 to 24 year olds and free delivery is less. So is there an opportunity here for retailers to make more money from same day delivery when younger people visit their sites? Consumers expect to prioritise brands that meet their needs and have sufficient product availability. This resonates with the requirements we've already seen around reliable deliveries, indicating that there will be few places to hide for online retailers who get the basics wrong. Being cheap is less important than it used to be. And having a loyal following as your USP isn't quite so great now because people are simply less loyal. If you are a retailer with availability and you help people out during the COVID crisis, then you look to be one that will do well going forward. And this is an opportunity to steal customers from rivals. There are big shifts in what people care about. And if you can satisfy those, then you're going to grow your market share. And one positive outcome from this lockdown is most of us are walking a lot more and cycling more. We're outdoors, we're noticing and enjoying and appreciating nature more than we used to. Uh, and this is a, a good example of um, a big change that no one was really predicting at the start of the year. Six out of 10 people who wouldn't consider themselves environmentalists want to be better going forward. But it's not just people wanting to better themselves. They expect this from their brands too. If you can show off your eco-friendly credentials and give your customers and your clients a more sustainable experience, then nearly 60% of buyers will thank you for that. This is an example of quite a significant but unexpected change over the past few months. Can you use this to win over people who are now less loyal to your rivals? Is this a way that you can stand out in your market and grow that market share? Uh, and one thing we're seeing at the moment that is uh, quite interesting and is good to see is a new style of brand communications and content marketing being born. It's one that's a lot friendlier, it's one that's a lot more helpful. And I think a lot of it's down to the fact that we're less formal these days. We've all been on Zoom calls where there's cats and dogs running around, there's children playing in the background and people you're used to seeing uh, wearing suits are turning up in T-shirts. And this is starting to filter out into companies not asking so much, what can I sell you, but more, how can I help you? And this is especially good for B2B marketers, because traditionally we're the ones who've been stuck creating very safe and often very boring content. But now that the events have all been cancelled, now that sales teams can't go out and meet people, content and the messaging needs to stand out more. And the more useful, the more personable your brand, the better. So can you be more open? Can you look for more ways to help customers and even speak to their passions? Because if not, you won't stand out in the current social media bombardment that is looking like it's going to continue for the near future. Um, and uh, we're nearing the end now. And one thing I did want to point out is how many brands are already embracing the long term consumer shift to being digital first. It's going to get a lot busier and a lot more expensive to compete and advertise online. If you want higher Google rankings, be prepared to fight for them. If you want more social followers, you need to make sure you stand out. Uh, what we're seeing from brands we speak to is previous digital winners are already figuring out what they need to do to stay ahead going forward. 
But at the same time, brands that haven't bothered with digital before are now starting to have a taste of how powerful it can be. They're shifting their budget from traditional media into these areas. And that's where a lot of the competition's coming from. And if you look at how much used to be spent in the B2B world on trade shows and then in B2C on billboards and bus ads and how all of that either got paused and is now waiting to be spent elsewhere or has already been put into digital, we can see that it's now going to be a lot more competitive. So it's worth having a think about if you've reviewed your budget allocation since COVID has shut down, because the odds are your competitors already have. Uh, and I was once told that when you put together a very data heavy slide deck is finished on a quote. So here's one from JFK, but there's plenty of others that are equally relevant. I believe it was Churchill who said, never let a crisis go to waste. If you are monitoring the data better than your rivals, adapting quicker and not taking your eyes off the long term goals of your business, then you can make the most out of situations like this lockdown. It can be your brand that's the one to benefit. Right then, that's basically it. And in the last uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I've mentioned plenty of things. I, I um, fully appreciate there's a ton of data here in this talk and loads of different tools to help you get ahead. So I thought it'd be easiest to collate all of this into a blog for you. So you can see the link on the screen now. If you go to that URL, you'll find uh, a handy guide for um, exploring some of this data and figuring out some of these things for your situation. I'll also put this out on LinkedIn uh, very shortly. And as Philip mentioned earlier, the slides and a recording of this will be available to you all. Uh, and thanks for your time. I hope you found some of this useful and that you'll be better prepared for the rest of lockdown and any changes to come. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth. Um, we're now going to have a short Q&A session. There are some really useful insights um, within the presentation. Um, the, the questions that I'm going to um, read out for Gareth, they've actually um, been coming in throughout the session, so they some of them refer back to some of uh, Gareth's earlier points. Um, I'm going to publish the questions so that actually you can see uh, as they come along. So. The first question, Gareth, is from Justin Willett, um, and he says, as you said, not really unexpected that search increased back to PC, but what did your clients and you do to change your activity? Uh, well, on the, um, I think that, that that was probably asked the first time I talked about um, device usage, because later yeah. on I, I kind of discussed this, but basically, uh, for the majority of uh, clients where we were managing uh, things like their Google ads, there was automation in place. So it was, it was automatically um, adapting on our behalf. And then we, we would override some of that automation if it wasn't going far enough or it was if it was overstepping the mark. Um, uh, I mean, for a lot of clients, this isn't a long term thing to worry about. If it had gone the other way, then any clients with a poor mobile experience or with slow loading websites, you'd quickly try and rush through uh, fixes in those areas. But this was obviously something that, that by going to desktop, most uh, businesses and websites are good on desktop. It's mobile where they're worse off. Right. OK, thank you. Um, <coughs> so the second question is from Chris Gilpin. Uh, we see more and more digital burnout from customers in B2B environments. So, so much traffic and starting to switch off. Is it time to take the foot off the pedal and slow down on digital campaigns? Uh, I suppose it depends on the campaigns. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, from my own experience just in the agency world, I, I, it is every single person in my game is now on LinkedIn like crazy. Everyone's doing research, everyone's blogging because everyone wants to stand out in this and quite a few people have got more time. So I, I completely get uh, the fact that people are getting burnt out by it. But I think the argument to be made for us as marketers is if, if we go dark now, you know, if we decide we're not going to bother um, being in the fight, then it's going to harm us long, long term. So I think it's another one of, you know, um, a good example of know exactly what your, your customers, your clients are into, what their problems are and really, really go out of your way to address those things. So you're not saying the same things as everyone else. You're actually being very useful. So it's a quality versus quantity issue. OK, um, there's quite a few questions coming in there, so apologies if I'm not able to cover them all. But the next one 
is from uh, is anonymous. Um, do you anticipate long term changes to organic Google ranking? Uh, yes, and short term ones as well. <laughs> There's hundreds of changes uh, uh, a year with um, Google. Um, I think in terms of, I mean, if, if I answer that from a keyword sort of demand point of view, uh, it, there's certain areas where 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 more we're more happy to search than we used to be, and looking at those examples, sort of the um, sanity stuff. So a lot of things that you may never have considered buying online before because you just go out to the shop and buy buy them, but because those shops are closed. Um, so things like exercise equipment. I think you know if uh, if you were in in the fitness game before lockdown, you're going to have a nice bright future going forward. So yeah, the some of the some of the searches we're doing have changed, will continue to change, and therefore the Google search results will as well. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so the next question is from Lisa. Um, what would you? What sorry? What would be your key advice for B two B business not having been very active with an e commerce channel to absolutely put in place to become successful? Uh, oh, that's a big question um, and a lot of it <laughs> wouldn't actually be in my remit. Um, oh, uh, if, we're look, if we're looking at it from a traffic generation point of view, then most of the B to B clients um, that we deal with are do, do very well from uh, pay-per-click, but also uh, via long tail keywords organically. So you need to basically have have a, a good old go at your SEO and your PPC. Um, uh, and then when it comes to something that works well in uh, B2B or any market where there's a long term uh, decision making process or repeat custom is remarketing. So, um, you know, if you're selling goods that in, you know, they might need a refill or, the, or they might uh, might be in the position to buy more from you in, in a month or six months time, put together some kind of a remarketing strategy to remind them that you exist. So you can you can automate your advertising to act almost as like a sales team and remind your customers who you are. Right. OK. Um, so now we've got Ricardo Weber. Gareth, do you think a potential second spike of COVID-19 will repeat your findings or will we see more and other changes? Uh, I, uh, I think we will see some of this uh, going through a cycle again and some of it completely different because we kind of know what we're what we're looking at now and also a lot of people have already bought their, <laughs> their exercise bikes. I think uh, I mean some of these things like um, uh, you know buying uh, the sheer volume of booze we buy online in this country is quite scary. Um, not quite as scary for me when I was the last one to the party and all the shops had already sold out. But um, you know this 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 some of this will just be part of our nature if there are future lockdowns. Whereas some of it, I think we've already. I mean we can see that in. In March and April, there were huge changes that in May had kind of reversed. Right. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got here. So, a question from Adele Do you see 24 7 response for B2B rather than the traditional nine to five working day? Uh, no, I, I personally haven't seen any um, evidence that there's a need for that. Um, what I, I think in the people in business to business are still used to working uh, B2B hours. So I, I, if, if you have a 24 hour respo uh, response option, then you're going to stand out for it. So maybe it will be something to, you know, a, a message that's worth showing and a USP for you. But I don't see it as a huge area to be spending time and money. Right. Um, next question is quite topical. Uh, what are, What is your thoughts on the current issue with Facebook? Should companies be stopping their ads or not? Uh, that's up to the companies themselves. Um, I've. Uh, I mean, I, I, a little caveat here. I'm the guy that years ago told everyone, "Don't bother buying shares in Facebook. The PPC system's crap. It'll never be as good as Google." And I basically cost a lot of people a lot of money with that advice. So I will. I will always be very careful when answering Facebook questions going forward. Um, 
Uh, I don't. I don't know. You, the, the problem I've got with a lot of these things we're seeing with brands at the moment is it doesn't. It, it quite often this activity doesn't line up to the core brand values, and you know that it's kind of jumping on a bit of a bandwagon. And for me, in some instances, when you spot that, it feels quite false. And I think so, some of these brands may, you know, they, they need to kind of clean up their own their own act um, before sort of, um, you know. Going for going for platforms like Facebook. One thing I would say, though, if you are not inclined to go on said bandwagons, then Facebook traffic is cheaper at the moment. So break a leg. Okay. Um, so the next question is: You mentioned that budgets are likely to have been reviewed, including money that might have been spent on billboards. Do you think that budget should now be spent on digital? Does it have a place as a complement to digital? Uh, yes, it certainly does have a place to complement digital. I mean, one of the things we will see for, for a lot of brands that have done traditional um, brand advertising, whilst they will have saved money uh, in the last few months by not doing out of home ads or not doing TV ads, is that their brand searches online will probably have fallen. So, you know, there is a direct correlation there. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I have always been of the belief that, you know, you should do online and offline advertising. I mean, most of our clients have some combination of the two. Um, it'll be what will be interesting to see is because TV advertising at the moment is pretty cheap and I'm seeing uh, plenty of adverts on buses and, and on um, outside billboards right now that you can tell were put up in like January and February They're for TV shows and films that have been out for ages. So it's um, how cheap is that stuff right now? You know, maybe if maybe it could be a case of if you're not reinvesting that money into more digital, could you just make your your offline advertising go way further? Okay. Right. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, um, Gareth. I, I would actually say I think Gareth, you offered to if we, if we collate all of the questions that come in, including the ones that we haven't asked, you know, you'd actually put together a little Q&A sort of um, hand, handout. Uh, yeah, uh, so afterwards. definitely. What, what, what me and uh, a couple of the guys at Liberty thought would be good is that any questions people have got, if we if we have them all and then we can start either answering them maybe in a, in a blog post or a series of social messages, though I have found out, that unfortunately, one of those uh, members of my little squad uh, has been diagnosed with coronavirus today. Oh, Timing. Oh, as usual in my lifetime, it is absolutely impeccable. Um, but yeah, okay. uh, if, if I can have all the questions, we'll work on things anyway. And she's absolutely fine, by the way. Okay, good. Well, we'll compile those. So um, I'm just going to ask this last question then um, and before we conclude the session. So um, lots of smaller companies have set up e-commerce stores for the first time and use digital marketing to keep businesses going through the pandemic. Many may want to continue doing, doing this, but how can they compete online with bigger, more established brands? Uh, these, um, I mean, one thing. One thing I would say with online is it's quite often uh, a a uh, playing field leveler. It's like just because you're not one of the household um, retailers, you can still fight with them. Uh, what I would say is if you're if you're dipping your toe into this, then start small, learn where you can best compete, um, and probably start off with pay per click ads. I mean, Google Shopping is usually the highest ROI uh, any retailer will get online. Um, so just do some of that, do it for some of your products, figure out what messaging works for you, figure out what bid amounts work for you, figure out what prices work for you, things like that, and then roll it out into your other marketing. So I wouldn't start off by doing things like SEO or your content marketing until you've learned those lessons. Um, but I mean, we've, you know, something of, I mean, of, at the start of this presentation, I showed off some of the big brands because that's what us agencies do. We love showing off. However, a couple of our biggest clients started off as very small brands and over the last few years they grew and we're, we're having a bit of a celebration with one client at the moment because when we started working with them four years ago, they were doing just under £30,000 a month digital and now they're doing two and a half million. So it's like they're now one of the three biggest retailers in their sector online up against two huge household names. So this stuff is very, very much possible. It's, n it's never a case of, you know, you're too late to join the party. OK, Gareth, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So um, that is um, all we've got time for today. Um, I'd like to say, obviously, a thank big thank you to Gareth for presenting and a thank you to CIM Wales for hosting the event.
And of course, a big thank you to all of you for attending and submitting your questions. Uh, I hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Just finally, before uh, we leave you, um, just a little advert. Our next webinar express is on Wednesday, the 15th of July at 1 p.m. The topic is Know Your Customer. Uh, you'll find it listed on the CI website in on the event section where you can register for the session if you haven't already done so. And once again, as a reminder, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's event and we would really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So finally, on behalf of CIM, thank you very much for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.